Well, again, this is a Resurrection Sunday. Uh, wish you all a, a joyous one today, and whatever you do today with friends and family and just your communion with the Lord Jesus. I want to preach a message today called, He Left the Grave Clothes Behind. So if you will turn to John chapter 19. Jesus was buried, the Bible tells us. He was buried because he died. And the Bible tells us how he died, and the Bible tells us why he died. He died for sin, not for his own sin, but for our sin. And in dying for our sin, he freed us from it. That freedom, however, is, is a very encompassing thing that itself, we need to have the fullest measure of understanding of that freedom by his death and by his new life. He freed us not just from the penalty of sin. Again, not just stamping us fireproof, not just giving us a pass. So he didn't just free us from the penalty of sin that was ours by the law that we had violated, the moral law of God. But he freed us from its power. Now this is a package deal. Just as you cannot take Christ as Savior without taking him as Lord, so the freedom uh, secured for us in his death and resurrection is a freedom from the penalty and power of sin. It's a package deal. And if you've only heard half the message, then you've only gotten half the deal. You're rowing with one oar in the water, and you'll be like, uh, like I was myself. I was just going in circles for a long time. It didn't seem like I was getting anywhere in the Lord, but the Spirit of God, He's a wonderful thing once He's within us. He, he just begins to shine forth, to bubble out of the saints of God, and, and He tries to come out, and He will come out unless we stifle Him. But there was something about the Spirit of God in me that just kept saying, in the, those early years as a Christian, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. And hallelujah, there was. And the Lord brought me into it. And I'm not alone in that. I'm not exclusive in that. You don't need to come to me to get it. I can help you find it. I can be not a lord of your faith, as the Bible says, but a helper of your joy by pointing, you, uh, pointing others in the direction of these truths instead of flopping around like I did for so long a period of time. And so he freed us from the penalty of sin and its power, from the guilt of sin, the stain of sin, from having to live, the bondage of having to live in a life of sin. Jesus freed us from all of those things. And so Jesus was buried. Now Pilate, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea at that time, he allowed it. Joseph of Arimathea, as we'll read in the scripture, Nicodemus, he allowed them to take the body of Jesus and to bury it. He did this in order not to further antagonize the Jews, most probably. It was a day before their high Sabbath, and uh, it would have been a, a great insult to them to leave bodies, uh, executed bodies on the cross, although that was typical Roman custom. You know, when, when somebody was crucified, they weren't crucified high, way high up like we see in the movies so often, very low to the ground, very near to the ground. And so, unless they were watched constantly, particularly after death, you know, the dogs would come by, the scavengers would come by, and, and what was left, the Romans would oftentimes take and throw into a ditch, and then they would just cover it with lime. But Pilate, in this case, allowed the friends of Jesus, who begged the body of Jesus, he allowed them to have it, to take it, and to bury it. Let's go now to John, chapter 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Now, let me make a note here, being that uh, the prior two weeks' messages were on watchfulness. Next week we're going to talk about watchfulness again. Let us not thump Joseph of Arimathea too long, because the Bible said that he was a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews. There may come a time in our culture, in our society, indeed there will be in the, in the global environment that will come to pass, when those of us who are followers of Jesus will have to be somewhat private about it. Many of the avenues of evangelism or the avenues of being public about our faith will be closed to us unless we enter into them at great peril. And nobody foolishly puts themselves into peril's way just to prove a point. Death and martyrdom come to saints oftentimes. They have from the first, but even the early Christians, the first century Christians said, we do not go out and seek it. When it comes to us, we do not run from it and hide but we do not go out and seek it. And so Joseph of Arimathea should in every and all respect be taken as an honorable and a devout disciple of Jesus. 
He besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein never was man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down, and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. We see in this portion of scripture that uh, Jesus was prepared for burial. He was wound in linen along with spices. They brought about a hundred pound weight of spice and uh, the winding that uh, materials, linens that were used were not the ace bandages that we use today. They were wider, broader strips of cloth because they had to hold in these spices in whatever form, whether they were powder form, whether they were larger piece form, they had to hold that in next against the body. That was the purpose of the linen, after all. And so Jesus was wound in this linen along with the spices. And this was done, of course, to mask the stink of corruption. The Jews did not bury their, their bodies under the earth. They buried them above ground uh, in the sepulchers like this. And no matter how well you seal it up, Perhaps they were able in some cases to seal up a, a tomb where nothing would get in, nothing would get out. But oftentimes, uh, I, I guess uh, leading to the, the uh, winding and spicing of the dead, the, the smell couldn't be contained. And so the linen was to hold the spices to the body, and, and the spices and the linen working together were to mask the stink of the corruption of the body. Uh, in, in our culture, we use aromatic flowers. Now, we have really no problem with this today because we have embalming and that slows decay, and so we're not faced with that problem. But in, in earlier years, when that wasn't the case, then aromatic flowers were used, and that aroma was used to mask the smell of corruption that was beginning to set in while the family was grieving and prior to the burial. You know, bodies are ugly things as they decompose. Maybe our, our sense of grossness is being worn away by so many programs on television now. You know, crime scene investigation and forensics that give us little glimpses here and there of bodies in different states of decomposition or trauma or whatever. But basically they're ugly things as they decompose and they're best kept out of sight. And uh, again, the Jews wound the bodies with the linen and the spices, to mask the stink of the corruption, but also to, to contain the effects, uh, the, the consequences of the bodies as they would decompose. Well, we know, of course, that these efforts were wasted on the Lord Jesus because he was not going to see corruption. He was not going to decay. His body would not return to the dust. His body was going to be resurrected. You see, Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Hallelujah. Jesus rose from the dead. Take note again that Mary and, and the Gospels say some others along with her, they came to further anoint the body. Now, Jesus was buried in, in Joseph's sepulcher because it was nigh at hand and they had to make quick work of it. And they found the stone rolled away and he was not there. Now, her report to the disciples was this. Not that Jesus had risen from the dead. She said they have taken him away and we don't know where they've laid him. And so Peter and John run to the sepulcher. John gets there first. John looks in. Peter arrives, and then Peter goes in first. 
And they both see that the body is gone. And the Bible says here, then, uh, verse 6, Simon Peter followed John, and he went into the sepulcher, and he saw the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, John then goes in, following Peter, verse 8 says, and uh, he saw, and the Bible says, and believed. What did he believe? He did not believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. He believed what Mary said, they have taken him away and we don't know where they laid him. That's what he believed. Because the next verse tells us that. Verse 9 says, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. The Bible says as yet they knew not the scripture. And yet in the gospels we read many times he told them. Many times Jesus told them clearly, I must go to Jerusalem. There I will be offered up. There the, the, the Pharisees will kill me. There I'll be crucified and I will rise again the third day. And yet they didn't believe that. They believed instead that he had been taken. And yet the grave clothes had been left behind. It seems that thieves would most likely have taken the grave clothes with them. If they came in to steal the body, they must make quick work of it. As we'll read in an, another biblical account, when Lazarus came forth from his grave, he came out with his grave clothes. That word lying means to be stretched out. They were just laid stretched out as they had been when they contained a physical body. They were still laying there stretched out. They weren't just unwound and, and piled in a pile, which is what you and, and I would probably do. Most people, when they go home and they undress, they take their clothes off, they drop everything in a pile. You undress for the night, you don't lay your socks down here, and then you take your slacks off and lay them out here at the end of your socks, and then take your shirt off and lay that on top, you know, just as it, in order when you were wearing them. You just throw them in a pile. And if they had unwound the grave clothes, that's probably how the thieves would have piled them. The order in which they were laying out, the larger linens that wrapped the body and contained the spices... And then next to that, by itself, not on top, not in a pile, but by itself, just as it had been when it contained the body, was the towel that enclosed Jesus' head, and it was laying there separate. Jesus didn't wake up and sit up and have to unwrap himself. He came out of the grave clothes. He was gloriously resurrected in a glorified body. And saints, it's the same kind of glorified body that you and I are going to get if we are here and alive when Jesus returns. The Bible says there will be some who are alive and remain when the Lord comes back. What's going to happen to, to their clothes? Will their clothes be changed too? Kind of like a, it was with Cinderella. You know, she's in there in her tattered and her ash smudged dress and, and smock. And she's got the scarf around her head and all of a sudden that just dissolves and, and there's a beautiful gown in its place. No. We're just coming out of those clothes. Hallelujah. And we'll be in glorified bodies. We'll be in glorified garb. And that's the way Jesus was raised from the dead. And so the grave clothes were left behind. I don't believe there's, there's a great significance to be accounted to the position of the grave clothes because they were going to soon see the body. The grave clothes had little to prove for just a short period of time because Jesus himself was going to appear shortly. What need have we then of the proof of grave clothes when you've got the actual person standing there in front of you? But they were left behind because Jesus was through with death. There was no need for grave clothes. The purpose of this message is not the fact that Jesus left his grave clothes behind. Because as I said, the grave clothes being left behind and the position of the grave clothes, that proved relatively little. That's of, of, of not, not no significance to us, but of small significance because Jesus himself, by many infallible proofs, showed himself to be resurrected. And so what is the significance to us today as saints? What application can we make to ourselves in that the grave clothes were left behind? Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Paul's made a number of statements here now along the lines of the great revelations that Paul said he was given by the Lord. What it is to walk as a saved person, to live as a saved person. And what Paul writes about in Romans 6 and yes, Romans 7 and 8 it goes back to what I told you earlier in the message here that Jesus freed us. It's a, it's a total package from the penalty and the power of sin. This is what Paul writes about. Now, in Romans 6, 4, he says this, Therefore, 
He's making a conclusion now, or at least a point, if not a final conclusion, at least a, one of his main points. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so the statement from the scripture, or from me anyway, as I preach this portion of scripture to you, to the saints today, is leave the grave clothes behind. We don't need them anymore to mask the stink of the corruption of sin in our life. Leave them behind. What does that mean? Well, you know, we, we dress up the dead, don't we? At funerals, we take oftentimes miserable sinners. We dress them up in clothes that their whole lives they swore they'd never be caught dead in, and here they are. <laughs> They're caught dead. In I would be caught dead in a dress like that. I would be caught dead in a suit like that. And there they are. We put them in a suit. We put them in their best dress. We throw in an artifact or two, something that was special to them or that they were known for. We, we perhaps throw something in there, and then we stand up and tell stories about who, how good they were. That's why it's tough to preach funerals. Preaching a Christian funeral is easy. It's hard sometimes when the unbelievers come and ask to have a funeral in a church. What do you say about someone who's died without Christ? Who's gone on to, into a Christless eternity? And even if they lived the semblance of a decent life, what if they didn't? What if they were just a reprobate? What do you say? And yet we dress up the dead. I mean, we have to go through our saying goodbye process and we ought to show respect for the dead because it was a human being. We ought to be treated with respect, but perhaps there's some of the extremes we go to that we don't need to go to. But you know, we start dressing up the dead long before they're dead. We start putting grave clothes on long before we're dead. And we do it to mask the corruption of sin. Early on in life, perhaps, we wrap and bind ourselves with a spice of pride to mask our sense of littleness. Or maybe we do wrongfully have a sense of superiority over others. Undeserved. Whether it's a sense of inferiority or a sense of superiority, it still stinks. And so we wrap it with the spice of pride. Yeah, it's grave clothes. And we walk around in it. We walk around bound by pride to prove to ourselves and other people that we're bigger than we feel we are. And while we're yet alive, we wrap ourselves in the linen, the grave clothes of arrogance or aloofness. We are distant. We stand off from other people. Many times we do this to mask our hurt. We're afraid of being hurt. And so we're standoffish. And people get the idea, boy, what a stuck up, what a snob. And it smells in us. It's an unbecoming aroma of our character, of a person's way of living and a way of behaving. And yet that's what it is. It's grave clothes. Wrapping this stinking spice of arrogance or aloofness to us to mask the corruption of a hurt heart or fear of hurt. Some wrap themselves in the grave clothes of bitterness. It's one of the most acrid, disgusting smells. The one that you immediately turn away from. I mean, there are some where you, I guess you kind of tolerate, some even kind of sickly sweet. You can handle it for a little while, but there are some where, whew, boy, you just turn away right away. Bitterness is one of them. And yet some wrap themselves in that because they're masking the corruption of pain in their soul, pain in their, their heart and in their mind. Some wrap themselves in the grave clothes of lying. Their whole life's a lie. They find themselves continually stretching the truth, building themselves up where they ought not, claiming things that they ought not, not only about themselves but about other people not able to achieve greatness themselves, they find themselves going through life lying and tearing down others. If I can't make myself a great man or a great woman, at least I can bring everybody else down to my level so I don't feel so small. But there are those that wrap themselves in the grave clothes of deception and lying to themselves and others simply to mask the truth about their life. The truth is, we are more willing to accept one another the way we are than we think we are. These are all grave clothes, saints, dressing up the dead, and we start to do it long before we draw our final breath. And so we have multitudes of walking dead people. We want to hide the signs of aging. I have two pairs of glasses in my possession. 
that I use. These here are the bifocals. You can see the little lines in there, and everybody that looks at you can see them. I have another pair of the trifocals because somewhere along the line I lost my mid-range of clear vision. And so I needed trifocals to fill in that gap. Well, they talked me into buying lineless trifocals. You can't see the lines, uh, but, but the, the, the magnification is there. The, the only problem is that there's just a little narrow band. See, now here, the whole lens is doing the work, and I can just kind of move my eyes. I've got my peripheral vision low and high, close and far away. But these lineless ones, there's just a skinny little band in the middle of the lens. And unless you're looking out there at one little band, and you've got you know, whatever magnification you need, you don't see anything. It's all kind of fuzzy and hazy. And, and I thought, I was thinking, I got to laughing about it today. Why did I buy those? I did it for vanity's sake. I did it to mask the fact that I'm growing older and I've got poor eyesight. And so instead of that, I want to hide the fact that I have poor eyesight from people. So I buy these lineless things. So now I'm going like this all the time. And they go, man, that guy's really old. He's got Parkinson's disease. Look at him. <laughs> you see what a lie it is? And then we do things like that to mask the signs of age. There's nothing wrong with adorning yourself. There's nothing wrong. The body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the Bible says, has certain things with which she adorns herself beautifully. Christian women as well. And not all of that adornment is inward. There is some outward adornment that is right and proper and is fitting. But you know you can go too far with that to try to hide the fact that you're getting old. And that the body, the flesh is just losing it. That it's aging and that it's falling apart. And so we lie to ourselves. We go have doctors do things that make us look other than what we really are. Sometimes to grotesque extremes today, to hang on to this thing of youth when the corruption of age is setting in. Or sometimes there's just hard living. A person's been living awful hard, and so they have to put the makeup on a little thicker, you know. They have, to, they have to hide the fact that sin has taken such a toll on their body. But what is that? Whether it's sign of age or whether we're wrapping ourselves in grave clothes to mask our hard living, we're trying to use those things as spices to cover over, to either mask our sin or to mask our fear of death. And so different ones bind themselves throughout life with different of these grave clothes. I don't know what your particular one was before you came to Christ or what your particular grave clothes might be right now. But you've got them unless you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, you ought to leave them behind. He left his behind, and the message is for us to leave ours behind as well. But you know, sometimes we don't do that. Romans 6, 4 says, Jesus was raised to new life. We have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. He was changed so as to come out of those grave clothes, leave them behind, and not need them anymore. Now I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21. Because there are Christians, those who are saved, those who have been born again, new life is theirs. And they either haven't had the whole package preached as far as their full freedom and their full deliverance, or they're having a little trouble with their grave clothes. They still wrap themselves in bits of tatters of pride, aloofness, bitterness. Some hang on to bitterness, even as Christians, and it's sad. They don't have to. They ought not to. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21 Paul, speaking to the saints, says this, If so be that ye have heard him, that him is Jesus. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation. That is, your whole way of living concerning the former conversation, put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. You see, even before we're dead, we're walking in death without Christ. And the corruption and the stink of the corruption of death in flesh and sin, clings to us. And we, we mask it with the grave clothes. We dress ourselves up in. Verse 23, rather, says to the Christian, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. In John 11, 43, 44, I mentioned Lazarus a little earlier, and, and I want us to read about him now. 
Jesus was at the grove of Lazarus, and, and you remember the dialogue he had there with Martha and Mary. But his sister said this to him, Lord, if you had come earlier, our brother would not have died. And they pointed out to him that it had been four days since he died, and by now he stinks. The corruption of flesh of the body is underway. And if we roll the stone away, he'll stink. Jesus knew what he was going to do, and he was going to raise him from the dead. And so he prays to his father, and in verse 43 of John 11, the Bible says, When he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin, just as they would do to Jesus in a short while. And Jesus saith unto them, those that were standing there nearby, Loose him and let him go. My dear friend, Pastor Jim Bozoski, took a trip to Israel. Went to see the, any of the holy sites, the shrines they have over there. And one of them that he visited was the tomb of Lazarus. He said, I know it's not the right place. They lied to me. That's not Lazarus' tomb. I said, how do you know he said, well, when you go in the front of it, there's a stone stairway that goes way down. And the Bible says, Lazarus came forth bound hand and foot in his grave clothes. He said, they must have stood there a long time after Jesus said, come forth. If Lazarus had to hop up all those steps, bound hand and foot. But that's how he came out. And Jesus said to those that were standing nearby, loose him and let him go. Lazarus was alive. But he needed a little help unwinding. Sometimes we get saved, we need some help on winding because, boy, the grave clothes were so tight. So many layers sometimes in our life before Christ. And Jesus said to those, loose him and let him go. As Christians, we're free in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're free by Jesus Christ. But you know it seems in the scripture that we are appointed to help one another unwrap some of the grave clothes that bound us. Because try as we might, we tend to bring some of that with us into our new life in Christ. And it takes some getting over. And God has appointed us to help one another. He says to those of us, when we notice these things in one another, we notice perhaps a pride or an aloofness or an arrogance in a brother or a sister in Christ or a new Christian. Hear the Spirit of God. Hear the Lord Jesus saying to us, loose him and let him go. Help him. Help him unwind from that. I've given him a new life. I've freed him, but you help him and loose him and let him go. Can you hear the Lord saying that to you? Ephesians 4.21 says, If so be that ye have heard him. You know, every child of God, every born-again Christian has heard the voice of Jesus as Lazarus did. Lazarus was laying stone cold dead in that tomb. And he heard the voice of the Son of God say, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. And the Bible says here in Ephesians, if so be that you have heard him. Christian today, remember when you heard the voice of Jesus said, come forth. Come forth. I'm calling you to life. Come forth. And you came forth. You heard the voice and you came forth and you knew that new life was yours and, and yet you realized that you had some growing that you needed to do yet. You had some things that you needed to come out of and enter into. You needed a little help unwinding some things in your life. And you know, God is just so gracious. He puts within the church everything and everybody we need to help us unwind, to get unwound, to leave these grave clothes behind. But we've got to want to do that and to cease dressing up the dead. And so we help one another. We start helping one another at home. We start being kind and gracious. Here's a scripture I want you to turn to now, Colossians chapter 3. This will be our closing scripture. And this is why I say we are appointed to help one another unwrap the grave clothes that bound us. We don't need grave clothes to mask the corruption of sin and flesh because Christ has freed us from that and has given us something much better. Colossians 3 verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy. Learn what it is to feel compassion and to feel mercy from within. Not just, well, I've got to be kind to you and I'm just going to be kind no matter what it takes. But to have it come from within and be a real thing. A work of the Spirit, as Jesus said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water to come from inside. And to have there inside 
the kindness, that when we need kindness, we, we can look within ourselves, and there it is, put there by Jesus, by the Spirit of God, a kindness within our heart. A humbleness of mind. We don't need pride and arrogance anymore. We have a humbleness of mind. We, we know exactly who and what we are in Jesus Christ, and it's enough for us. I know that I'm accepted in the Beloved. I know that I'm approved of God. I know that in my heart, and so it doesn't matter what this one thinks of me or what that one thinks of me. It keeps praise from lifting us up too high and it keeps criticism from pounding us down too low because we know. We have a humbleness of mind that's of the Spirit of God and the Word of God in our heart. Meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another. See, now, that means doing these things to each other, showing these things to one another. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Saints, when we do these things to one another, we help those who need the help of unwrapping the grave clothes that they're still struggling in. They don't need them anymore. Those who feel they must be on the defensive, stretch the truth a little bit, help them to understand. If Christ has accepted you, so do I. You don't have to prove anything to me. I'll encourage you to walk and to live in the same standard of holiness that I am. Yes. But I'm not going to crush your head if you fall short. I'm not going to crush your head if you stumble. I've stumbled myself. I remember the young Christian family that took me into their home when I was first saved. And they taught me what it was to pray every day. The blessing of it. And when I stumbled greatly the first weeks as a Christian. I was quite a drinker before I got saved. And the first weeks after I got saved, I thought I was strong enough to go back into those settings and back into that environment and be with those same friends, and I wasn't. And the next thing you know, I was drunk and passed out and ashamed and embarrassed that I'd ever told anybody I was a Christian. And I went to their house, and I sat on their couch, and I, and I wept in my shame, and they came to me, I know the brother Bill did, and, uh, or Bob was his name, he put his arm around me and he says, though the righteous man falls seven times, God will uplift him with his mighty hand. What a blessing it was for me. And, and Bob just helped unwrap the grave clothes around me and helped me to learn to walk in the freedom that Christ has secured for me. We who have accepted the robe of righteousness, we have no further need of grave clothes, do we? No, we have no further need of grave clothes. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Again, we see that these are things we are to exercise toward and on one another, helping one another. As Jesus said to those standing around about Lazarus, loose him and let him go, so we help one another. Verse 14 of Colossians 3 says this, And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The purpose of the grave clothes was to wrap and to bind the spices to the, to the body to mask and to hide the rottenness of corruption. We're told here in Colossians to put on charity, love. That doesn't mean that, that everybody in your life is going to think that uh, you just uh, wink at everything and allow everything and approve of everything. There are times, man, where love's going to have to be tough, amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. But even then, that tough kind of love, if it's the right kind of love, the love that comes from God, it will help us be firm and be strong and yet be compassionate about it. We'll find within ourselves, even as we're delivering a hard word, we'll find the, the bowels of mercy at work. Hallelujah. Why? Because we've left the grave clothes behind. And there, in the robe of righteousness, having no need of grave clothes any longer, we have put ourselves around ourselves, wrapped ourselves in charity and the love of God, which is the bond of perfectness, the bond of maturity. It's one of the adornments that the bride of Christ gets to wear. It makes her so beautiful. It's one of her most gracious adornments. That love binds the fragrance and the beauty of Christ to us, of all that Christ secured for us in his death and in his resurrection. Saints, he left the grave clothes behind. We ought to as well. Hallelujah. Let's stand.
Are you here today and new life is not yours? You know it. God knows it. But you're hearing Jesus say, come forth. Come forth from death to new life. Leave the grave clothes behind. It doesn't matter how good they look. It doesn't matter how fine a job they're doing at masking the corruption of sin in your life. It is still there. And today you hear the voice of Jesus saying, come forth. I encourage you, come forth today. Come to him. Come from where you are. Come forward and say, I hear the voice today and I want to come. And I want to live in Christ instead of die in my sin. I'm coming today. I'm leaving death and sin behind. I'm leaving sin behind. I'm leaving my grave clothes behind. I want to come to Christ and receive the power to live free of sin and not just freedom from the penalty of sin. I want to have all that in my life. And so I want to come to Christ today. I hear his voice saying, come forth. And you want to come forth. You come forth this morning. You stand up front here. And I want to pray for you. Or perhaps you're here today and you say, you know, I kind of feel some of those grave clothes in my life. As you've been preaching today. And uh, a couple of the points you hit on. That's me. That's in my life. And I want prayer. I want help unwrapping that. If you want prayer for that today. And you want to come forward. I'll pray for you. And you and I, by the Spirit of God, will go to the Word of God and you'll be free. Hallelujah. Somebody did that once for me. And I want to do that for somebody else. I trust you do as well. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for those today who are dead in their sin. And they're hearing your voice right now, calling to them, saying, come forth to new life. We pray, Lord, that even as Lazarus did, bound in his grave clothes, that they would come and you will set them free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We pray for them today, Lord, that they would be able to push aside every obstacle that comes up in their mind and their heart right now and come forth to be yours. We pray for them today. Let this be their day. As, as this is your day of resurrection, Lord, that we're remembering, let this be their day of being raised to new life in Jesus Christ. For them. God, I pray for uh, all today who heard this message, who are your children and perhaps felt that in this area or that area of their life, there are just a bit of the grave clothes hanging on yet, slowing them down, keeping them bound in that area, and they want to be free of that. Whether well, it's a thinking wrong things about themselves, too much or too little in their own mind, God, and it produces a fear in them, Lord, a holding back, a hanging back, God, and they're not giving themselves to you or to their brother and their sister as they know they could or they want to even or, or as they ought, God. I pray for them today. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would find within ourselves now bowels of mercies as we look at our brother and our sister who may be struggling in some of these things. Perhaps what they've heard, Lord, didn't promise them that freedom. Oh, it promised them uh, a new life. It promised them heaven when they die, but not really much of a changed life or a new life here. We pray, Lord, that as we see them, God, that mercy would flow from us and we would share with them that living word, God, that word of deliverance, that word of freedom. And God, in that and by you, we would help to loose them and let them go from that. Bless this message to our heart, God. May it lift us up. May it do us good, God. That as we come forth, Lord, we would be a, a shining testimony to your glory, to your power. That you might receive all the glory and the honor and the praise. For you have done the work. You have secured it for us. And by you, because of you, it has become ours today. For that we love you. For that we thank you. We give you our affection and our obedience today. Lord, you have our heart, our life. Our moments are in your hand. Our eternity, God, we have entrusted to you. We thank you that you keep these things with such a strong and mighty hand. Give us a rejoicing heart all day today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.